Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Landy, the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture, and welcome to Reem Library. The McFarland Center sponsors conferences, lectures, special events on issues relating to meaning, morality, and mutual obligation. Uh, you can view our upcoming events and listen to talks, uh, including pretty soon this talk will be posted online, so you can tell your friends what they missed and they can watch it, but they won't get the real thing live like you are. Um, and those are at holycross.edu slash McFarland Center. Today I'm really pleased to welcome an alumnus of the college, uh, Richard Higgins of the class of 1974. He's going to help us celebrate the 200th birthday of Henry David Thoreau, whose contributions to natural history and American literature continue to capture the imaginations of Americans, especially uh, those of us who live here in New England. Rich is author of Thoreau in the Language of Trees, a brand new book, uh, published earlier this year by the University of California Press, uh, which has received some nice reviews, including the New York Review of Books. We saw that. I did see that one. Uh, and Atlantic Monthly. Atlantic Monthly. Okay. I didn't, uh, didn't catch that one. But uh, The book explores Thoreau's deep connections to trees, his keen perception of them, and the joy that they gave him, uh, the poetry that uh, he saw in them, and his philosophical view of them. Today, Rich will tap into an aspect of that reverence to explore Thoreau's misunderstood religiosity and his perception of the divine in nature. A writer, editor, and lecturer in Concord, Massachusetts, the heart of Thoreau country, Rich is co-author of Portfolio Life, published in 2006, and the editor of four books on religion, including Taking Faith Seriously, published by Harvard University Press in 2006. 2005. A staff writer for the Boston Globe for over 20 years, he's also written for the New York Times, the Atlantic Monthly, Christian Century, Smithsonian, UU World, and the International Herald Tribune. Rich is a graduate of the College of the Holy Cross, as I mentioned, and Columbia Journalism School and Harvard Divinity School. So please join me in welcoming Rich Higgins. Here we go. Well, thank you very, very much. It's a pleasure to be back here, it really is, and seeing Holy Cross look so beautiful. And I'm trying to concentrate on the, uh, the, the sacred mystery of age, rather than, rather than just feeling old. But uh, 44 years ago, it was that I became a freshman here. Well, <clears throat> Thoreau and God. For many people, that is an oxymoron, and perhaps with some justification. I think, however, it is better understood as a riddle. Given the highly variable and often head-scratching things Thoreau said about religion, as well as the contradiction between his stated views, whatever they were, and what he did, it seems that a puzzle is what he intended it to be. Now, the standard view is that Thoreau was spiritual but not religious. I don't fully dispute that viewpoint, but I do wonder if it is not a projection of the predominant secularism of our society and, and the academic world, and thorough studies in particular. I ask because it omits the palpable, undeniable presence of a loving, benign, imminent God in his writing. Now, I'm not talking about his few overt theological pronouncements about, about the nature of divinity or the ineffability of the Godhead. I mean his occasional, affectionate, and sometimes even emotional comments in his journal and letters he wrote about, about God, and sometimes to God in the second person voice of the Psalms. These were moments when, despite the poison darts that he threw at churches, clerics, and creeds, Thoreau reveals his deep religious instinct. Now, Emerson said that uh, despite Thoreau's petulance toward, church, toward churches, he was a person of rare, tender, and absolute religion. Many of Thoreau's contemporaries uh, agreed, including his epistolary correspondent here in Worcester, where Thoreau actually had kind of a small fan club, that would be H.G.O. Blake, uh, said that uh, he understood it was Thoreau's purpose to, quote, lead a fresh and simple life with God. And Isaac Hecker, a transcendentalist friend of Thoreau's, turned Catholic priest and later founder of the Paulist Fathers, uh, said that if Thoreau had lived in the fifth century, he would have been a desert father. 
Well, I found that they were right while writing my book on Thoreau. And so today I'd like to consider how Thoreau's perceptions of trees bears out this view. Now, Thoreau wrote about trees for a quarter century. He observed them very closely, knew them well, and described them in detail. But he did not presume to fully explain them. He respected a mysterious quality about trees, a way in which they point beyond themselves. For Thoreau, trees bore witness to the holy and emerge in his writings as special emblems and images of the divine. Trees were spires, he said, that lifted his vision to heaven. Now, just what this word meant to him is unclear. It's under our feet as well as over our heads. Uh, but he used heaven often, including in all its forms, heavenly heavens, etc., 48 times in Walden. And he frequently linked heaven and trees, uh, especially in his journal. By fall, an industrious red maple has grown, quote, nearer, nearer heaven than it was in the spring. Elms, quote, take a firmer hold on earth that they may rise higher into the heavens. Loggers felled a majestic pine that for two centuries had been, quote, rising by slow stages into the heavens. He writes a prayer on a leaf, and the bough springs up the scrawl to heaven. An oak sapling is driven back to the earth again 20 times, as often as it aspires to the heavens. When he used that and similar metaphors, Thoreau revealed a part of him that is easily misunderstood. Now, it's true he railed at the bigotry and ignorance of, form of organized religion. He found its doctrines despairing, its clergy torpid, and its rituals as superstitious as those of the pagan Roman temple. Men run after the husk of Christianity and forget about the seed, he wrote. He thought that the stern god of the Puritan meeting house had perhaps, quote, too many of the attributes of a Scandinavian deity. And he could be very funny, excuse me, and sarcastic. He said, referring to the um, Doctor of Divinity degree, which is the DD, he said he would rather listen to the chicka DDs than the DDs. And when a minister said he was going to plumb the depths, <clears throat> the minister said he was going to plumb the depths of Thoreau's soul, and he, was, and he replied, well, I hope you don't strike your head on the bottom. But, <clears throat> but despite these views, Thoreau was, in fact, religious to the bone. He had a deeply religious cast of mind and a profound sense of the holy. He rejected the meeting house not because it represented religion, but because it profaned it. It killed a true religious impulse, he wrote. Quote, we check and repress the divinity that stirs within us to fall down and worship the divinity that is dead without. And after writing that men seek but the husk of Christianity, he goes on, the quote continues, the kernel of Christianity is still the very least and rarest of all things. There is not a single church founded on it. Formal religion with its doctrines, exclusivist claims, and sectarian squabbling was peripheral to the religion he sought in nature. A religion by revelation, as Emerson called it in the Divinity School Address in 1836, or a newer testament, as Thoreau put it, the gospel according to this moment. He was simply not interested in defining it. Experiencing it was all he cared about, and trees often led him to it. They were his shrines and burning bushes, the forest, his cathedral. Uh, its spires, he said, inspired him more than the whitewashed village steeple. Alone in a distant wood, he got, quote, what others get from church going. Quote, a forest is in all mythologies a sacred place, Thoreau wrote, and that would include his own. Now, before looking at Thoreau's direct religious experience in the woods, I want to briefly mention two other ways that trees brought out his deep religiosity. Emerson famously said that um, in nature one finds a sanctity that shames our religions. Thoreau agreed, and he, tried, he sought to convey that sanctity 
in emphatically religious language. He complained, for example, that cutting down trees to build the Puritan meeting houses had caused the desecration of far grander temples not made with human hands. In fall, Thoreau collected dead branches, logs, and driftwood for his winter fuel. And he saw his act of splitting and burning them as a religious exercise. Quote, these old stumps stand like anchorites, which are an old archaic term for a, a religious recluse, uh, and yogis. So they, these old stumps stand like anchorites and yogis, he wrote, quote, putting off their earthly garments, more and more sublimed from year to year, ready to be translated, and then they are ripe for my fire. I administer the last sacrament and purification. Now, it is tempting to dismiss these references as mere figures of speech or rhetorical, rhetorical flourishes, as your own Professor Christopher Dustin, whom I have yet to meet, has written in a chapter on uh, Thoreau's religion. But Thoreau was nothing if not deliberate uh, in his choice of words. And in using religious language, he was trying to get to the root uh, that, of such terms as they were drawn from nature and so to, to recast and vivify them. And though his theology could hardly be called um, Christian, the religious language that he chose was often from Christian poetics and scripture, a tradition that he was deeply immersed in um, and respected. Excuse me. In autumnal tints, his you know, magisterial ode to trees, really a wonderful uh, late essay of his worth reading. Uh, the autumn leaves contentedly, quote, return to dust again and are laid low, resigned to lie and decay at the foot of the tree, he wrote, echoing both Genesis 3.19 in the King James Version. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And the tree a traditional Christian cipher for the cross. Now, in Christian typology, the fall stands for man's enslavement to sin and to death. In autumnal tense, it heralds rebirth, just as spring does in Walden. A town surrounded by a primitive forest, Thoreau wrote in uh, Walking, his essay Walking, is fitted to raise not only corn and potatoes, but poets and philosophers. In such a soil grew Homer, and out of such a wilderness came the reformer, eating locusts and wild honey. That, of course, would be John the Baptist. In December, <clears throat> Thoreau was delighted to find some life left in the shrub oak leaves. He had a real thing for shrub oaks. He loved them very much. Uh, they are exceedingly beautiful in their withered state, he wrote. If they hang on, it is like the perseverance of the saints. Their colors are as wholesome, their forms as perfect as ever. How poetically, how like saints or innocent and ben beneficent beings they give up the ghost. How spiritual. Now, one metaphor Thoreau used for trees over and over again was spire, a majestic tree that rose like a column and brushed the sky really moved him. Unlike the church steeple, which sits on a building, the tree's roots reach down into the earth, while its crown pierced the emprium, uh, the highest heaven, uh, uh, connecting, connecting both of them. Spiring upward was deeply meaningful to Thoreau. Aspiration to a higher life was at the core of his being. A man who doesn't believe that each day contains an earlier, more sacred, and auroral hour he wrote in Walden, has despaired of life. My desire to bathe my head in atmospheres unknown to my feet is perennial and constant, he wrote Reverend Blake here in Worcester. Uh, and if a man constantly aspires, is he not elevate, elevated? And finally, again from Walden, very direct, I believe it is in my power this very hour to elevate myself above the common level of my life. 
the spiring of trees somehow symbolized to this to him. See how the pines spire higher without end, higher and higher without end, and make a graceful fringe to the earth, Thoreau wrote in A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers. In Maine, majestic firs, spruce, and pines steepled the forests, in his words. I was struck, he wrote, by this universal spiring upward of the forest evergreens. All spire upwards, lifting a dense spearhead of cones to the light and air. Trees also symbolize the religious idea of resurrection to sorrow. His masterpiece, initially titled Walden, or Life in the Woods, that was the subtitle, ends with a parable of life in the wood. The bug, famous bug, entombed in the dry leaf of a uh, kitchen table made out of the wood of an apple tree. Uh, and the larvae uh, lay dormant for 30 years and then hatched by the heat of an urn, he proposes, uh, gnawed its way out to enjoy its perfect summer life at last. Whose faith in a resurrection and immortality, he asked, is not strengthened by, strengthened by hearing the story. And Thoreau's immersion as a naturalist in the late 1850s in the dynamics of the forest deepened this link between trees and rebirth. Leaves die in autumn only to rise again in new trees, he wrote. The fallen leaves still live in the soil, whose fertility and bulk they increase, and in the forests that spring from it. They stoop to rise, to mount higher in coming years by, some, by subtle chemistry, climbing by the sap in the trees. In November 19, 1860, Thoreau saw young, young pines and birches filling a pasture that he knew from his own experience had lacked a single tree 15 years before. Um, I confess I love to be convinced of this inextinguishable vitality of nature, he wrote in his journal. <clears throat> I would rather that my body be buried in a soil thus wide awake than in a mere inert and, in, inert and uh, dead earth. And in the Maine woods, he famously pro proclaimed the white pine to have an immortal, an immortal spirit. Referring to the loggers, tanners, and turpentine makers who see only the practical or monetary uses of the tree, Thoreau writes, it is the living spirit of the tree, not its spirit of turpentine, with which I sympathize. It is and which heals my cuts. It is as immortal as I am, and perchance will go to as high a heaven, there to tower above me still. I can't show you. I usually have slides. I give a talk on my book more generally about Thoreau and trees. And I have a photograph I took at Sleepy Hollow Cemetery where Thoreau is buried, uh, a very small gravestone. But um, by God, it, it is surrounded by towering white pines, I assure you, on uh, page 162 of my book. Um, but the most important way that trees touched Thoreau's religiosity was that they renewed his spirit. When I would recreate myself, he wrote in walking, I seek the darkest wood, the thickest and most interminable swamp, and enter it as a sacred place, a sanctum sanctorum. The forest was a spiritual elixir to him. The penetrating, aromatic smell of the pine restored him, he said. At the sound of the wind in the trees, quote, my heart leaps into my mouth, he wrote in August 1851, I suddenly recover my spirits, my spirituality, through my hearing. A few years later, the sight of pines below Fairhaven Cliffs in Concord, shining in a clear ethereal light, awakened him inwardly. Seeing this, he, seeing this, he wrote, my spirit is, is like a lit tree. Excuse me. The winter woods uh, held mysteries for him, and he walked in them more as supplicant than as naturalist, alert to the mystical. Is there no trace of intelligence there, whether in the snow or the earth or in ourselves? No other trail but such as a dog can smell? 
Is there none which an angel can detect and follow? None to guide a man on his pilgrimage? Thoreau did think that institutional Christianity fostered resignation and despair. The Christianity that he knew in his day, which would be <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, Calvinist-derived, Puritan-derived uh, Unitarianism. Trees conveyed just the opposite to him. They expressed a naked confidence, he wrote, and stirred a joy and gratitude that was truly at the heart of his spirituality. The spruce, the hemlock, and the pine will not countenance despair, he wrote in the Natural History of Massachusetts. The winter of their discontent never comes. The riotous autumn colors of trees suggested to him that life's routine should be interrupted, quote, by an analogous expression of joy and hilarity, that our, quote, spirits should rise as high as nature's. Loggers and lawyers with their saws and laws do not know how glad a man can be in the woods, glad with an entire gladness, he wrote. Nature, Thoreau said, is full of genius, <clears throat> full of the divinity. Yet how he spoke of that divinity changed with his rhetorical purpose or even mood. In his more formal philosophical speech, it was generally described as an impersonal, ineffable divine principle, very similar to what Emerson proposed. And the more polemical and defiant he was, the more it sounded like pantheism. Yet, in his more private speech, when writing about his experience of the sacred in nature, in letters to people and in his journal, it is surprising how often Thoreau turned to more conventional religious terms and to speak more tenderly, vulnerably, and reverentially. All the motions of nature, <clears throat> the running stream, the waving tree, the roving wind, must be the circulations of God, he wrote. Exhilarated by the flowing motions of the sail and the wind, <clears throat> he said he felt <clears throat> blown on by God's breath, like his very body was fluttering and filling out gently with the breeze. On September 7, 1851, a day on which some scholars believe he crystallized his life's mission, Thoreau pledged to find God in nature. If by watching all day and all night I may detect some trace of the ineffable, then will it not be worth the while to watch, he wrote. Now here he's alluding to a motif in the Psalms, the three Psalms that use the <clears throat> watchman waiting to call out the light. So will it not be worth the while to watch, <clears throat> to watch for, describe all the divine features which I detect in nature? My profession is always to be on the alert to find God in nature. Out in the woods after a snowstorm in January 1853, Thoreau heard the bells of the first parish church in Concord. <clears throat> Men obey their call and go to the stove-warmed church, he wrote, <clears throat> though God exhibits himself to the walker in a frosted bush today as much as in a burning one to Moses of old. Now, the God that Thoreau described was not that of the Christianity of, of his day, swooping down from on high, but a God woven into every twig, trunk, and blade. It was a benign, loving, and above all, familiar presence to sorrow. A presence like the one that dispelled a moment of loneliness he felt a few weeks after he moved to Walden in July of 1845. So he's expressing, he's having kind of a moment's doubt, you know, I'm not going to last here without any society for, you know, the length of time I want to be here. And then he said he suddenly became aware of the presence of something kindred to me, <clears throat> an infinite and unaccountable friendliness all around him. Every little pine needle expanded and swelled with sympathy and befriended me. Now, I don't know if that meets your definition of a spiritual encounter, but that, was, that passage was good enough for William James to cite in the Varieties of Religious Experience. Thoreau also spoke in Walden of occasional visits 
on long winter evenings from, quote, an old settler, an original proprietor, who was reported to have dug Walden Pond and fringed it with pine woods, who tells me stories of old time and of new eternity. And between us, we managed to pass a cheerful evening with social mirth and pleasant views of things, a most wise and humorous friend whom I love much. And at times, Thoreau spoke affectionately to God, as he did in the passage I cited earlier about being his, uh, hearing the sound of the wind in the trees and being vivified by that. It was August 17, 1851. And this is a very long passage, but it, it goes on. Ah, if I could so live that there would be no desultory moment in all my life, I would walk. I would sit and sleep with natural piety. I thank you, God. I do not deserve anything. I am unworthy of the least regard. And yet I am made to rejoice. I am impure and worthless and yet the world is gilded for my delight. Now, at the same time, as, as much as Thoreau experienced God as a familiar presence, he did not claim to know the exact nature or source of these divine stirrings he experienced in nature. They were unfathomable. The trees, he said, knew things that he did not and would never know. Quote, <clears throat> You are never so far in them as they are far before you. Their secret is where you are not and where, where your feet can never carry you. Well, how to piece together this puzzle? We can look historically and see a number of influences on Thoreau's religiosity, including the Huguenots, the French Protestants from whom Thoreau proudly descended and who actually worshiped in the woods to avoid persecution, moving a chair around uh, in France. And um, the uh, Quaker, George Fox, uh, the antinomian Puritans like Anne Hutchinson, who placed personal revelation at the heart of religion, and of course, Jonathan Edwards, who knew a divine rapture in, in nature no less than thorough. Excuse me. Now, and Thoreau was too habitually anti-clerical to look into the Catholic tradition, I'm sorry to say, but it seems clear to me that he would have found common cause in the writings of Teilhard de Chardin or more recently, say, Father Thomas Berry. When Thoreau casually referred to himself as a Protestant in his essay, A Yankee in Canada, he was really speaking of his cultural rather than his religious uh, identity. But I think he nevertheless spoke a great truth. He was deeply reformist as a religious thinker, a Protestant in the extreme, uh, Emerson called him. The divine principle for Thoreau was ever new, always taking new forms, making, quote, a new impression every instant, and thus could not be reduced to one formulation or even contained in one religion. The perfect God, the perfect God, so not merely the God projected by other men and women, has never got to the length of one creedal proposition of the church, he wrote. Now early on, this is, gets confusing, early on, Thoreau appears to move beyond uh, Emersonian idealism, the belief that all nature is emblematic of a higher spiritual reality that a higher reality lies somehow behind it. May we not see God, he asked in a week, which he wrote in the late 1840s, published in 1849, his first book. <clears throat> May we not see God? See God, okay? Uh, are, we, are we to be put off and amused with a mere allegory? Is not nature rightly read that of what she has taken, commonly taken to be the symbol merely? So is not nature God? These lines are often cited to prove that Thoreau was a pantheist. But I think that over the course of his life, he answered those questions, no. Even later, in the same book, in the Friday chapter of a week, he writes that it takes only a moment's sanity to realize that there is a nature behind the ordinary and that we live on the outskirts of that region. In 1850, he wrote Blake, 
<clears throat> that the immaterial realm had more power for him than the material one. Quote, I find that actual events, notwithstanding the singular prominence which we allow them, are less real than the creations of my imagination. And in 1854, Thoreau sees a beautiful red cardinal. And he imagines initially that deeper woods hold a redder, wilder, truer, more vibrant one. But after looking some time, he concludes that the bird of his imagination cannot be matched, is never to be found. The red bird, he writes, the red bird, which is the last of nature, is but the first of God. And this, too, is a very Protestant notion, the idea that the human imagination and yearning for God, stirred by the Bible, exceeds whatever can be attained of God through material religion. Sola scriptura, by nature alone are we saved. Thoreau did think along the same lines, but he did Calvin one better, omitting not only the priest but the church altogether. One could know God, he believed, sola nature, by nature alone. Now, it must be said, and with great humility, that in all likelihood there is no religious, religious frame that will do justice to Thoreau's uh, religion. And Thoreau himself, of course, does not help. <clears throat> what is religion, he asked? That which is never spoken. And when he did speak, he would not toe the line. Quote, I know that some of you will have hard thoughts of me when they hear their Christ named beside my Buddha, he wrote in a week. Yet I am sure that I am willing that they love their Christ more than my Buddha, for the love is the main thing, and I like him too. Love was indeed the main thing for Thoreau, and he made that clear in one of the few times that he did offer a definition of religion in a letter September 8, 1841 to Isaiah Williams, uh, a friend of Emerson's uh, interested in transcendentalism. Religion, Thoreau wrote, is where your love is. Thank you very much. I would be pleased to answer any questions if anyone has. Yeah, well, I'm not sure about the latter. He certainly did set fire, accidentally, of course, to... Uh, uh, a few hundred acres of woods in 1844. He was camping with a friend, and <clears throat> they cooked some, caught some fish, and they set a fire in the uh, stump of, an, of a yellow pine. It was loaded with resins, and it was the driest April in the records in the history of Concord. And uh, so everything was just, you know, it was like a match, and it did burn some 300 acres. Um, it took him a long time to come to terms with it, um, I, it certainly did not hurt his motivation to understand and champion trees, but I, I don't know that it was the main motivator. But it, he, he, he did, um, he was the, the scapegoat in Concord for a very long time after that. Uh, the passage uh, that's being referred to is when Thoreau, in the first section of the Maine woods, uh, Katahdin, he goes to the biggest mountain in Maine, Mount Katahdin, and uh, which is, you know, even today it's not climbed all that often, but then uh, even less so. And he gets up alone ahead of his companions and has a really kind of chastening encounter with a nature that is not very benign, uh, not very disposed to welcome him there. And he, he feels like he's in the, 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 the manufactory of the earth. It's, it's just this raw wild, a desolate, um, un, unforgiving, a forbidding place. Uh, so, and it's, you know, so he recognizes you know, uh, that man's intercourse with nature is um, that there, there, there are um, just you know, places that, he is, that humans are not welcome. But I don't think that is a Theological. I don't think he has ascribes that to God. In the instances when he's talking about referring metaphorically to God as a, a familiar presence, he is talking about some kind of sacred mystery. He's specifically talking about something 
sacred in nature. Whereas in the Katahdin thing, he's really he's, if that's his idea, he's talking, he, he's flushing out his idea of nature. And nature and God were not identical. I mean, that's one of my points. They were very close, and God was in nature. But I don't believe that Thoreau felt that uh, nature exhausted God by any means. That he he wanted to. <clears throat> He found sanctity in, in, in nature, and he thought one way he could convey that would be by using religious terms that people were familiar with. But he was also subverting them to um, you know, sort of re redefine them. Um, I'm not sure that answers your question. Yeah. Um, and he was very learned in the Bible. It's really, uh, I, I, I've read a... Uh, uh, when some professor collected all the all the allusions to the Bible in Walden, and Walden, it's like you know two and a quarter pages. There's some 130 references to the Bible, and, and they were and it wasn't just he actually had the the passage in Walden and and the passage in the Bible, so you could see. And uh, uh, yeah, well, I mean, I think that um, religion certainly <coughs> has more to do with communities of faith, I mean, for one thing. Now, Thoreau was not religious, and it's true in that sense, but um, there are religious categories of thought, um, you, know, um, you know, belief systems. It's, it's simply, it's more, more formal, more, more communal, and more enveloped in tradition, that spirituality can be what anyone feels at any particular time. It's a highly... You know, Thoreau's religiosity was highly individualistic, but he, he was spiritual, but he was he had a very religious he saw things in religious categories, which which not all spiritual people do. Um, yeah. Right. It was not just that he was thunderstruck all of a sudden by the you know, the beauty of nature or God of nature, but you're quite right that he was uh, conscious, intentional, being intentional about it. Um, seeking out the spiritual in nature, he says that you know we don't see <clears throat> we don't see things unless we have a desire to see them. So he had a desire to perceive the spiritual in nature, and he he was an extremely disciplined observer of of, of nature in general, and that carries over into his uh, his his religious quest. Yes, for sure. And discipline is a part of being religious. Um, you're, you're absolutely right that he drew enormous sustenance from Eastern religions. Uh, he read Vedic Indian texts fairly early on. Um, I would say <clears throat> right after Harvard, uh, he graduated in, in 1837. Uh, he read the Laws of Menu, and he was just you know just uh, you know amazed at how beautiful and profound they were. He actually then was exposed to a bit of Buddhism. Uh, later in the 1840s, and these had a huge influence on him without a question. I think partly I focus on um, the, the, this, you know, this question of uh, God and nature from a somewhat more Christian viewpoint, precisely because of his attacks on the church, which I think are very familiar, more familiar to people. He didn't attack Eastern religion, but his um, very, you know, uh, caustic. Uh, treatment of, of, of churches have let, created this misimpression that he was not religious. And so I'm partly, I am addressing that. But you're quite right, for a fuller profile of his uh, religiosity, uh, absolutely he, he was uh, believed that the Hindu texts and whatnot had tr tremendous wisdom. Yeah. And thank you, thank you for pointing that out. Okay. Well, I enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you very much.